Right now in America, we are seeing a lot of people that have just gone through a hurricane and the devastation that that has caused. And the scary thing is, is there's another hurricane lining up to hit Florida right in, in its wake. You know, and, and I remember uh, years ago, Jackie and I uh, had the pleasure of going through a hurricane. And uh, when you hear these things, you know, you go out and you, you do some preparation because you know things are going to get bad. And so, you know, you go out and get the bottled water and you run the water in the tub so you have as much as possible and all these different things. And after it hits, you know... Uh, you kind of find out, you know, you kind of step back a few years before electricity and things like that and kind of experience what maybe some of the earlier, uh, you know, pioneers experienced. And we were, uh, we were uh, at a friend's house during the hurricane because our subdivision was evacuated because it was supposed to flood. And, you know, we, we went out and, you know, we had a pretty good evening as the hurricane approached and as the wind started. We went out and watched the fireworks show. Yeah. It was all the transformers blowing up. Yeah. You know, you'd look in the horizon. <laughs> you know, oh, that was pretty. Oh, that was a blue color. <laughs> you, know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it did that for a little while, but then all the lights went out, and that's when you had to go around and light your candles and you had your flashlights and all that kind of stuff. Because that was one of the things you did. It was prepared for was the, you know, the nighttime. It was going to be dark. And we, we talked about that a little bit last week, but, you know, we know how to prepare for dark, right, when it comes to natural disasters. You know, people have their flashlights and their lanterns and they have their generators and all that because, you know, inevitably night is going to come. And I don't know about you, but I don't like walking around in the dark, especially in a house, you know, because my toes are going, hey, there's things there and you're going to hit them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <coughs> your toes start screaming out, don't do it. But uh, we looked at <clears throat> the church last week and how, you know, darkness has overcome some of the churches because the fact that they have stopped shining their light. I wanted to look at that just a little bit back more. And, and the idea here is how do you turn the lights back on? You know, we know what happens, you know, if a light goes out, how do you turn the light back on? Well, you change out the bulb, or you go and, you know, reset the breaker. Or around here, you look out and see if the neighbors are got light or not. You know, if they're dark, you know it's a power outage. If not, then it's like, I better go investigate some more. But what happens when the spiritual light goes out? Well, let's look at that just a little bit here. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to go back to a passage that we referred to last week. This is found in Revelation chapter 2. <laughs> Revelation chapter 2 this again is our Lord and Savior talking to John and he's talking about the seven churches these seven churches I think represent the, the church age because you can look at each one of these churches and a lot of people have said well this fits the first century this fits the medieval times this, you know, and you can look at some of the things that occurred in them but it, it also says in these passages, you know, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. It can apply to us today. Each and every one of these churches can. But the first church he addresses is the church at Ephesus. And we're going we're gonna to look at this just a little bit. But, but first of all, let's back up just a, 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 a verse and, and read verse 30 of chapter 1. This is Jesus giving us the explanation of what, what John has just seen. And he says here, The mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, or that could be interpreted as the messengers or the pastors. Mm -hmm. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now he goes on, he says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, 
that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name, and have not grown weary. And we'd love to stop there and say, oh yeah, that's us, right? We've persevered and we have not grown weary. But let me ask you, do churches or do, do congregations grow weary? Yes, they do. do individual members grow weary? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. But it doesn't stop here. Jesus goes on and says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Now we can stop there and say, what is Jesus talking about? Our first love, well, he's not talking about that crush he had in grade school <laughs> or something like that. You know, he's talking about that love for God that we had. Mm -hmm. We love God because he first loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Mm -hmm. That should be our first love. But, you know, this church, they were doing all these things, but they lost sight of that. They weren't doing it out of love anymore for God. They were probably doing it out of habit. They were doing it out of, you know, thinking that they were doing something to impress God. He says, yeah, you were doing all these things, and, you know, I commend you for it. But the very thing that he holds against them is that they lost their first love, that, that desire to, to love God. Because you know, that's what we're told, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might. That's the first and greatest commandment. But they're not doing that out of love anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, sometimes we need to stop and look at ourselves and say, why am I doing it? Why am I here? Why am I at church? Why am I reading my Bible? Why am I doing these things? Is it to gain brownie points in heaven? Well, these, these people were doing all those things, yet God says, I hold this against you. Well, it continues on. He says in verse 5, Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the thing you did at first. Do you remember the thing you did at first when you became a Christian? Were you excited? Yeah. Did God make a change in your life? Mm -hmm. were, you know, were you willing to share that with people? Were you willing to love the, the congregation, the body of the believers? You know, that was before we had discernment of, oh, we can't associate with those people over there. They're the wrong denomination. <laughs> we can't associate with that group over there because they don't dress up in suit and, and ties. You know, all those different things when we get discernment. Mm -hmm. No, he says, do that which you did at first. You ever seen a new Christian? For the most part, they drive people crazy, don't they? Because <laughs> they're so excited. They're running around, they'll praise the Lord, God bless you. And hey, do you know, the, you, know, you know my Lord and Savior, Jesus? Let me tell you all about him. And people are like, don't sit near him. You know, they're driving crazy. <laughs> this church had, had gone down that path. And, and they're now probably, you know, in their little cliques and, and doing their, their cliquish things, you know, and, and, and they've kind of lost that first love. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, repent. We, you know what that word repent means, right? Basically is turn back and go back to where you came from. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus told that to his disciples when he first called them. He said, repent and follow me, mm -hmm. talking about their sins. Well, here he's telling this church to repent. But he gives a warning. He says, if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Remove your lampstand. We looked at that last week. We talked about how the darkness is spread. Why? Because there are a lot of churches out there that no longer have a light to shine. Jesus has come and removed that lampstand from amongst their midst. And now probably, you know, and, and the sad thing is there's a lot of churches that have not perceived that God is no longer there with them. Because mm -hmm. they're doing the thing that they always did. And why did they do it? Well, it's because of what we've always done. Mm -hmm. Tradition, religion, all those different things. And they've lost that love of God mm -hmm. and of worshiping him. 
and spending time with him in fellowship. Yeah, that's what we were created for back in the Garden of Eden, is to have fellowship with God. But we've kind of forgotten that. But he goes on, he says, But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, this passage sounds like there's a cutoff point, right? A point when God says, I'm done. I've removed my lampstand from your midst. I'm, I'm gone. So what happens if a church wakes up and finds out they're in the dark? Or individually, you wake up one day and you find out that, that that light that you love to live in, just like Adam and Eve back there in the garden, they used to live in the glory of God in his light. After they sinned, they realized we're naked. And they tried to cover themselves with their works to be presentable to God. So they, they, they got the bright idea of sewing fig leaves together. God won't notice. We'll, we'll just cover ourselves in fig leaves. He won't notice the difference, right? God's like, who told you you were naked? <laughs> Did you eat of the fruit of the tree I told you not to? You know. So what happens? Is there any hope for this church if God has come and removed that lampstand? Well, let's look at that just a little bit. Turn with me now to Malachi chapter 3. Because I want to say this is a common thing in the body of Christ. I've seen it happen time and time again where churches lose sight or individuals lose sight of God. They forget what they're doing. They get caught up in the rituals. They get caught up in, in the churchisms and things like that. So let's see what God says here. Malachi chapter 3, let's read verses 6 and 7 here. And it says, I, the Lord, do not change. How many are thankful for that? Amen. God doesn't change. You don't have to guess, is he going to be the same today as he was back then? That, that's why we, you know, I would encourage you to read the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. Because you see God's nature there. And this is the Old Testament we're reading here. And he's telling this to his people. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. How many times did the nation of Israel fall? Drift away from God? Lots, yeah. I mean, you read the... And we get confused because the Bible isn't arranged chronologically. It's, it's grouped in different sections, right? Mm -hmm. And you read it and it's like, it seems like they, they get in God's favor and they fall. And they get in God's favor and they fall. And, and you, you, you get kind of confused, but it, it's happened a lot throughout history. Mm -hmm. That they go the way of the world. Mm -hmm. Just like a lot of churches. A lot of individuals. They lose sight of where they're going and they, they wander off, you know, like a toddler. You know, you ever go into the Walmart or something like that, you're there doing your shopping, and you look around, all of a sudden, where's my kid? <laughs> you, know, and you go on a hunt, right? Looking for them. They're usually over in the toy aisle or something like that. You know exactly where to find them. God knows exactly where to find us. You know, out in the world, getting all muddy and dirty. He says, so, o uh, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Does that apply to us? Yes. Can we not obey God and, and get ourselves into trouble? Can, can a church not obey God and get its lampstand taken away from them? Yes. That's what we just looked at. If we're not loving God, if we've lost that first love, that he, he says, I'm going to come and take that lampstand from amongst you. Mm -hmm. You know, we we're told there in Revelation, he says, repent, or I'll come and do this. But what happens if he's done that? Mm -hmm. Well, look at what he says here. He says, return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. 
God doesn't change. I think that church of Ephesus, if they found themselves without their lampstand, they need to say, you know what? We need to turn back and get back to God, that repent thing. He doesn't want to take his lampstand from amongst us, but if it happens, do the same thing he said to, to prevent it from happening. Repent and go back to him. Mm -hmm. That's what he's telling Jacob here, the nation of Israel, mm -hmm. to repent. You've fallen away, you continually go astray, come back to me. And I think that's really good advice for today's church, today's Christians. Mm -hmm. If you find yourself in the dark, get back to the light. And, and, and he is the light. And we looked at that last week, that Jesus is the light of the world. Mm -hmm. If you find yourself out there stumbling in the dark, we should be bright enough to realize, I liked it better when it was light. Mm -hmm. Just like when we lose power at home. How many of you like it when you have no power at home and you're in the dark? It's kind of a miserable time, isn't it? We've gotten used to being in the light. We like it. Yeah. We like our food cold in the refrigerator and our food hot on the stove and all those different things. You know, we're, we're creatures of habit, right? Mm -hmm. Well, our human nature also comes to play. We just looked at that in Sunday school. That sinful nature versus the spirit nature, always at war with each other. And sometimes we're like Paul. You know, we, we forget what we're doing when we find ourselves on the wrong side, right? Mm -hmm. So here he gives us the, 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 this is the Lord speaking. He says, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Amen. Now, just so that you understand that this isn't an isolated uh, occurrence in the Bible, we're going to look at a time that this happened to the nation of Israel, to Jacob. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 30. Second Chronicles chapter 30. And this is a story about Hezekiah and the nation of Israel, Judah specifically. Now, when we read these accounts, it's real easy to lose track of, are they walking with God? Are they not walking with God? You know, is he a good king? Is he a bad king? Because in the, in the books of First and Second Chronicles, they've had good kings for the, the southern tribe, but they've also had some that didn't walk with God. The northern tribes had pretty much departed from God. They went the way of the world. And, and the kings up north, they basically, they were jealous of their people. They didn't want them coming down to the temple at Jerusalem. So they set up their own holy places and told people, if you're going to worship God, you go to one of these places. Well, in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, God had specified one way only to come to him. It was through the sacrificial system, and it was through the temple. And that was how the nation of Israel could approach God. So the northern tribes, they had been prevented from actually obeying God and doing it God's way. And we see what happens when they don't do it God's way. They've strayed. They've gone the way of the world. So Hezekiah now, he's, he's basically, you know, he's king now, and he's, He's made aware of some of the things that have not been happening. So that's kind of where we pick it up here. We're going to start out in verse 1 of 2 Chronicles chapter 30. And it says here, Hezekiah sent word to all Israel and Judah, and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh, inviting them to come to the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover to the Lord the God of Israel. The king and his officials and the whole assembly in Jerusalem decided to celebrate the Passover in the second month. Now, the Passover, it's not one of the Levitical uh, feasts. It, it, it occurred before then. It was when God passed over the, in, the, in the land of Egypt and it was the, when he, the death angel passed over the land and those that weren't protected by the blood of the lamb on the, the doorpost and the lentil of the house, the firstborn were to die. And God said, you're, you're to remember that. But he also said, now, if you go to observe the Passover and either A, you're away, 
or you're unclean, you're ceremonially un unable to, uh, to worship or attend this, he gave them a second opportunity, and it was called the second Passover. And Hezekiah has realized that. He is saying, okay, we're going to gather together on the second Passover. Verse 2 says, the, or excuse me, verse 3 says, they had not been able to celebrate it at the regular time because not enough priests had consecrated themselves and the people had not assembled in Jerusalem. The plan seemed right both to the king and to the whole assembly. They decided to send a proclamation throughout Israel from Beersheba to Dan, calling the people to come to Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. It had not been celebrated in large numbers according to what was written. So you get the picture here. Hezekiah knows that the nations are divided, or the, the nation of Israel is divided. You got the northern tribes who long since have, have split apart from the southern tribes. And then he talked about Manasseh and Ephraim. Those are the, the sons of Joseph. And even though they're related, they're not in the promised land. They're to the basically the, the to the east of the Jordan River. He's inviting them too because they're his descendants. They're a part of the nation, really. And he's saying, you know what? We haven't done this in a long time. We need to do it right. It's not just us. It's the entire nation. Unity. Does God like unity in his people? Yeah, he really does. Remember Jesus in John chapter 17, he prayed for the church, us, that we would be united together as one, as him and the Lord are one. The Father and the Son are one. Let me ask you, is the church in the, in the world right now united? No. Oh, no. No, we are as, as divided as can be. Mm -hmm. And, and you, can, you can start listing all the reasons why we're divided. Religion. Religion, basically. It boils down to religion. You know, whether it be the, the size of the church, the color of the church, the color of the hymnals, you know, how you dress, how you worship, all these different things. We found reason to find fault with each other and we've divided ourselves. But Hezekiah here, he's trying to bring the, the nation back together to honor God and to worship. Okay? Um, verse 6, at the king's commands, couriers went throughout Israel and Judah with letters from the king and from his officials which read, People of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, that he may return to you who are left. Wow, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? They had departed from God's ways a long time ago. But here he's saying, return to God, and he will return to you. You know, in today's vernacular, or at least years ago this would have been the vernacular, it sounds like he is asking for a revival to happen in the nation of Israel. I don't know about you, but I would love to see a revival break out in God's church. Yes. Not just this building. I'm talking about the church of God. The ones that are, you know, the church that's basically aligned underneath the head who is Christ. His body. Instead of all these fractures that have gone on, to be united back under Christ. And that's what Hezekiah is asking for here. He's saying basically, come back to God so that he can come back to you. Who are left? Who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. Do not be like your fathers and brothers who were unfaithful to the Lord, the God of their fathers, so that he made them an object of horror as you see. Do not be stiff-necked as your fathers were. Submit to the Lord. I'm sure glad the church today isn't stiff-necked, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, we're not like Israel at all, are we? We're not set in our ways. Oh man, I've seen so many churches blow up because people would break tradition. You ever experienced tradition in a church? It's a nasty thing. It's a man-made thing, and it usually glorifies the church and not God. 
okay? Um, Come to the sanctuary, which he has consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. He's saying there's only one place that you can come back to God, and that's his sanctuary. That's what they were to do in the Old Covenant. The one place that God accepted worship from man. How about for us today? You know, come back to the sanctuary. We're told in the, in the New Testament or in the New Covenant, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as is common for some people. You know, he says you need to come together as a congregation. Same thing here for the nation of Israel. Yes, you can praise God and you can worship him wherever you're at, but he says, I want you to come together. Mm-hmm. Serve the Lord your God so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. Again, is that happening in, in God's church today? Are people turning away from serving him? I think we really saw it with with, with COVID. Mm -hmm. People who were regulars that would come to church no longer even attend. Mm -hmm. Why? They've turned aside. Now the argument could be made, well, were they really Christians or were they just doing ritual? Why do you go to church? Because we've always gone to church. Mm -hmm. That's not a reason. Mm -hmm. Do you love God? Mm -hmm. Do you want to honor Him? Do you want to worship him in the way that God has prescribed? Or do you think attendance is is brownie points in heaven? It goes on, verse 9. If you return to the Lord, then your brothers and your children will be shown compassion by their captors and will come back to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. He will not turn his face from you if you return to him. The the northern tribes, basically, had been taken captive by Assyria. You know, they'd been taken from the land, but yet some of them were now coming back. Some of them were trickling in. And and some, you know, he's basically saying, come on back and you will see God's compassion. Can God cause your enemies to fear him? Yes, he can. Can Can God cause your enemies to do good to you? We've been looking at that just a little bit. You know, remember Abraham when he went down to Egypt, you know, and he was afraid for his life down there and his wife, you know, and he he told that little story about Sarah being his sister. Mm -hmm. You know, or how about with Abimelech? You know, all those things. He caused, you know, God caused the fear to, to come over Abimelech. He says, what have you done to us? You know, you know and, and, and he blessed Abraham, right? Yes. He can cause that for his people even to this day. But notice he says, he will not turn his face from you if you return to him. That applies to today also. You know, some of the most miserable people you will ever experience in this life are Christians who have slid away from God. Mm -hmm. Oh, they'll have a smile on their face. They may even say, God bless you. But deep inside, they are miserable because they know they're not dwelling in the light like they're supposed to. Verse 10 said, The couriers went from town to town in Ephraim and Manasseh as far as Zebulun, but the people scorned and ridiculed them. How well is the message being received here about coming back to the temple, to the sanctuary God had, had designated for worship? Not many people accepted that, did they? It's they, they were scorned. How many people accept the message today to come to church? They're scorned, aren't they? Ridiculed. You guys still go to church? Oh, we know better now, don't we? We don't have to go there because that place is full of hypocrites. Well, it's also full of sinners because that's what we all are, right? We're all sinners saved by grace. But the same thing that happened then happens to today. You invite people to come to church. I don't need to go to church. 
Verse 11 says, Nevertheless, some men of Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. Same thing today. A few people will. Because small is the gate and narrow is the way that leads unto life and few there find it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't say not anybody will find it. A few will find it. Especially if we're telling them about how to get there. Let me tell you about my Savior. Come to church. Let, 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 let me introduce you to my Lord and Savior. There was a few. <laughs> Isn't it funny how people don't change even over the centuries? Hezekiah, the king, saying, come on, let, let's come back. Let's get things back to the way they were, you know, that God will return to us. And, and you can have God, you know, to, to, to basically he will turn his face to you if you return to him. But not many did. Verse 12, also in Judah... The hand of God was on the people to give them unity of mind, to carry out what the king and his officials had ordered, following the word of the Lord. I've got that one circled in my Bible. Because it says that the hand of God was on the people to give them unity of mind, to carry out what the king had commanded. I would challenge you, pray this upon our nation. Pray this upon our our churches, that God would cause a unity to, to come over his people. You know, again, that a revival would break out amongst his church. And I'm not talking about a whole bunch of people just hooting and hollering, you know. I'm talking about true revival where people return back to God. Turn their face towards him. Seek him while he may be found. Do the things that please God. Mm -hmm. Verse 13 says, A very large crowd of people assembled in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month. They removed the altars in Jerusalem and cleared away the incense altars and threw them into the Kidron Valley. You remember the Ten Commandments? What's the very first commandment God gave from Mount Sinai? Thou shalt have no other of the gods before me. The idea is here is that the nation of Israel, there in Jerusalem, his chosen city, they had idols. They, they had incense altars. They were worshiping other gods. They, they had these things that people were bowing down to. Do you think that would cause God to get mad and jealous? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they finally realized it. And they basically cleaned house. The second command he gives, Thou, thou shalt have no graven images and fall down and worship them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what the nation of Israel was doing. I think the priests and all, all the people, you know, they'd gotten used to it. You know, I'm sure glad people today don't bow down to other images, do they? Well, they may not be an image of, you know, some little god or something like that. But I can guarantee you people are bowing down and worshiping other things. I've heard stories of people that worship their cars. Some people go out in the garage and, you know, wipe down their car and talk to it and give it a little kiss before they go to bed. And you know it's their God because you look at their checkbook and all their money is going to that car. Yeah. That's their God. Yeah. But here they, they, it says they threw them into the Kidron Valley. That was basically the garbage dump. We're told that there was always a fire burning in the Kidron Valley, consuming the waste that was down there. They finally said, this is trash, this is rubbish, let's get rid of them. See, the, uh, the, uh, Jerusalem and his people, they were full of religion, weren't they? Just not what God had prescribed. They were doing things their own way. It says they slaughtered the Passover lamb on the 14th day of the second month. The priests and the Levites were ashamed and consecrated themselves and brought burnt offerings to the temple of the Lord. 
Now you may go, well, yeah, that's great. You know, that, that was back then, but what about now, right? How does this apply to us? I'd ask you to keep your finger here at 2 Chronicles. And let's look at a real quick passage. This one's found in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 4 and 5. <laughs> now, again, this is Peter basically talking to the church, to us. Verse 4 says, as you come to him. Now, he's talking about Christ. As we come to Christ, he says, the living stone rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this. How many people do you think are actively offering spiritual sacrifices to God that are acceptable to Him? You might go, wait a minute, we don't bring bulls and goats and oxen and all that kind of stuff and fellowship offerings and all those things. No, we're told in the Bible that we can offer spiritual offerings, you know, spiritual sacrifices, our lips that praise Him. Those are acceptable. Our prayers are like incense to Him. We see that as a, a picture given to us in the book of Revelation. The prayers of the saints are offered as incense before our Father in heaven. Let me ask you, how good is the priesthood doing today? Was it a lot like the days of Hezekiah where they were not offering the prescribed offerings and sacrifices? How are we doing? In your own mind, give yourself a grade. Zero being not so good, ten being I'm perfect. And then be honest with yourself and subtract about three. <laughs> the, the priests back in Hezekiah's day, they, they basically had forgotten all these things. They weren't doing them. And it finally said there, turn back to 2 Chronicles chapter 30. Again, we'll, we'll go back to verse 15. It says, they slaughtered the Passover lamb on the 14th day of the second month. Well, they were unconsecrated before, so you know they hadn't done it before. And it says there, the priests and the Levites were ashamed and consecrated themselves and brought burnt offerings to the temple of the Lord. Well, we were just told in, in 1 Peter that we are a priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices. How are we doing with this? Or are we ashamed? How much of the church today should be ashamed on how they are worshiping God? Are they doing it in a way that glorifies God, or are they doing it in a way that glorifies man? And it says, they consecrated themselves. It means they got themselves right with God. You and I can get ourselves right with God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1. We too can be consecrated back to the Lord. Verse 16. Then they took up their regular positions as prescribed in the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests sprinkled the blood handed to them by the Levites. So, or since many in the crowd had not consecrated themselves, the Levites had to kill the Passover lambs for all those who were not ceremonially clean and could not consecrate their lambs to the Lord. Although most of the many people who came from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun had not purified themselves, yet they ate the Passover contrary to what was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the Lord, who is, God, is good, pardon everyone who sets their hearts on seeking God, the Lord, the God of his fathers, even if he is not clean according to the rules of the sanctuary. 
And the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. Even back here, under the law, God forgave them. You know, they didn't do it quite right, but their hearts were right with God. They wanted to find God. They were seeking Him. And that's what Hezekiah prayed. And it said there, And the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. I think that was the beginnings of the true revival that happened in the, in the nation of Israel that day. Not everybody came. Not everybody sought to get right with God, but a few did. And those that did experienced God's presence and his face turning towards them once again. That's what I would desire for our church in America today. Is that we get right with God. If our light has gone out, get back to God. Repent and seek his face. And, and as we've seen, he'll come back to us. Ask him for that light. Lord, I'm tired of the darkness. Relight, rekindle that flame inside of your church. Let that lamp burn brightly in this dark place. That's up to us to pray. Hezekiah prayed for the people. Even though they weren't doing it exactly right, they sought to seek the Lord. Well, you and I can pray for, for our, our family, our friends, our neighbors, and everything else that's around us to say, Lord, send forth your spirit. Lord, we desire to see you honored once again. And we want to see your light burn. So if you find yourself in the dark as far as your spiritual life or in the church, Here's the example that we've been given. Turn back to God, and he will come back to us. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for the time that we have with you. And Lord, we know it's not the religion. It's the obedience to your word and the desire to spend time with you and to seek your face, Lord, that you honor. Lord, I ask that you will help us to burn bright the light of your love inside of each and every one of us, inside this church, this body of believers, Lord. And if we know of, of anybody, Lord, that has, has walked away from you, Lord, I pray that you will just put their, uh, or press upon us the need to pray for them so that they too would turn and, and repent and seek your face once again, Lord. Lord, our nation is in trouble right now, as you know. But it's only by your power, Lord, and your light and your love, Lord, that we'll, any, we'll see any change in this nation. Lord, it may not be many, but all it takes is a few. Yes. And we're praying for that, Lord, for a revival once again. Yes. Lord, we love you. And we ask for this in the mighty name of Jesus, your Son. Amen.